Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSEG, working for communities across New York State. Hey now, let's take a moment. So we all can figure it out. What it's all about. It's the homework Welcome to Homework Hotline. I'm Joe Zaniga. And I'm Sam Simpson. Homework Hotline is the place where you get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. Now, for more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games and other online resources and the latest episodes of our show. And don't forget, we want to hear from you on this topic. Should teacher allow laptops in class to take notes or should notebooks and pens only be allowed? Which seems to work better for you? Do any of your teachers tell students to write rather than type their notes? What would your policy be about electronics if you were an educator and why? All right, now you can weigh in on this topic and tell us what you think by visiting on Facebook and leaving us a message, tweeting us by using the hashtag HHVoiceIt, or by visiting our website, homeworkhotline.org, and clicking on the Voice It button. Remember, the most thought-provoking responses will be put on the air. The answers will be shared on next Wednesday's Homework Hotline. Okay. Now, a little later in the show, we'll be seeing what Tim Cawley from the <laughs> Rochester Museum of the Science Center has for us. But today is Thursday, and that means it's time for our science challenge. What do you have for this us today? All right, Sam, I'm actually going to put you to work today and okay. have to help me with this. So I have just a little battery holder. We've mm -hmm. got a D battery in Maybe here and got the two wires coming off okay. it. Okay. And we know batteries have a positive and a negative mm -hmm. end. Okay. I mean, it's touch those two ends? Yeah, you know, I'll take one, you I'll take, take one. one. Well, I should probably show what this is first. All right. This is just a little bulb holder. So I've got a light bulb, and then these are the two connections for the bulb. All right. So I'll take the red one, and I'll touch it over here. And I'll take this, this one, one and I'll touch it there. And our light lights right up, doesn't yep. it? Yep, lights lights up. Okay. Now let's switch sides. And I'll take the white one and touch All it right. on this side. I'll take this one. All right. And if we touch them again. Still lights up. So it doesn't matter which way we go. All it right. Lights up with them either way, right? Either side, yep. Okay. I got another little flashlight here. This is a handy little one. Okay. And this turns I've got on one in the of those back myself. Here. All right. And so that works. This works. But what am I going to do? I'm going to switch this battery around. And actually, this one comes with several batteries, so it's in a little battery holder. Okay. But I think we still can switch it around easy enough. All right, so here's the battery holder. And I'll have you put it back on. Sam, okay. you're probably a lot quicker at it than I am. So um, all I did was switch the batteries uh, around in there, the same batteries that we just had. So I switched it, and I'm right. uh, gonna try it? Sure, and we'll turn that on. Hey, it's not working. Try clicking it again. Hmm. Not working. Not working. Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, I think so All too. All right, and that will be our question. So our science challenge for tonight is, why didn't this flashlight work when I switched the battery around the other way? Again, the science challenge is, why didn't that light work when you switched the battery pack around? If you think you can solve the science challenge, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or just answer on our website, homeworkhotline.org. Answer correctly and you can have a chance to share that answer at the end of the show. But remember, every correct response will add our Hotline Hall of Fame, earn enough points, and you could win the tablet at the end of the season. You know, Sam, before we do the lesson, I will point out, I'll give you a little hint. It's not because it couldn't make contact, and when we switched that battery pack okay. around, it didn't fit. It fit fine, so it's not that we broke the contact. Okay. That's probably a little hint we should give them. Okay. All right. So the past week or so, we've been looking at tables and graphs, histograms, double line graphs. We've got the little granddaddy of them all, I like to call it. <laughs> Come over to the board and let's take a look. Today we're gonna to be looking at circle graphs. Some people call them pie charts, kind of the same thing. These you probably might get in sixth grade or seventh grade, but there's a lot of work involved. You got fractions, you got decimals, you got angles and percents. Let's take a look. So, why would you use a circle graph? They're used to show the relationship of parts to a whole. In addition to that, they use percentages to show that as well. So I've got an example over here. So this title of this thing is the grade level of US students. And you can see by various pieces 
by just looking at it. Which piece of that pie are the most kids in? It says grades one through eight, 45%. So you can visually look at it and see what the percentages and things are. The smallest one is other, whatever that is. Then we have 15% in college, 22% in, in grades nine to 12. It's kind of what a circle graph can do for us. Let's take a look at how would we would, how would we create the circle graph? There's like four or five steps. For step one is, you've got to calculate the percentage of the total represented by each category. You also need to find the angle measures for each sector, whatever that is, and we'll talk about that in a, in a moment, of the graph. Since there are 360 degrees in a circle, we've got to multiply that percentage by 360. Step three says, we need to use a compass. We'll talk about that. To draw a circle, mark the center using a straight edge, draw a radius, and then we're gonna make angles all the way around. And the angles will be at the percentages that we found. Finally, we need to put a, a title on that graph. We need to label each of the sectors. I talked about a couple of terms you may or may not be familiar with. An angle measurement. What are we talking about? So literally, for that circle, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna find those angles. So we gotta come up with that angle measurement. We also need to find a sector. What is, what is the sector? Well, that little slice of pie or that wedge, that's a sector. Those are a couple of terms you might not have been familiar with. So that's what we're gonna do. So, as always, Mr. Simpson's given his class another test. And they just finished it yesterday. So what I like to do, I have three different classes, I've got four or five, but I have three that take the same, same uh, course. What I like to do is surprise them on Friday. They're gonna get a pizza, whichever class had the highest average. So what I like to do is I like to survey my students and I say, okay, which what kind of pizzas do you like? I have about 150 students in my class, 45 said they like cheese, 60 said pepperoni, 40 said uh, they like veggies, and 12, 12 of those students said they like meat. So what I wanted to do is, I need to actually figure out, first of all, how many do I have here? If I add them all up, I'm supposed to have 150. <laughs> Let's just say we have 150. 150 students here. So what I need to do is find out which percentage each of these represents. So, so what I would do is I would divide each one of these totals by, oh, I left off uh, three here. That should have been 33 maybe. Well, they're all messed up. Let's use this one. So I had 45 cheese, 60 pepperoni, 12 veggie, 30 meat. And what I need to do is I need to take 150 goes into 45, and we've been doing this. And literally what we're gonna do is, we're gonna put a decimal, add a zero, 150 goes into 450 three times. So I'm gonna get 0.3, and I'm gonna do this for all of them. That's gonna tell me what percent of 100 it is. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that percent and I'm gonna have to multiply each of those percents by 360. So like I said, they've got fractions, they've got decimals, and they've got percents. If I were to fill this whole thing out, which I've done, maybe I didn't do that, but I've done it here. Here are all of my percentages. Once I have those percentages, what I need to do is I need to make the circle graph. And that's the part that I really wanted to show you how to do. So the first thing you want to do is you got to make a straight edge, which I did. And then what you have to do is, you've got to find an angle. I know for the largest one is what I want to do is 148, 144 degrees. So what I want to do is I want to line my protractor up and I want to go to 144 degrees, which is about right there. Once I had that, I would make a straight line from there and I would do that all the way around such that I do all of these angles. They should all add up to 360. Once I do that, which I've done it here for us, I have something like this. That's my circle graph, and if you notice, I put pepperoni, 
There's 144% of the students in my classes like pepperoni, 28.8% like veggies, 79.2% meat, 108% cheese, and when you do circle graphs, you gotta fill in each of those sectors. Well, I keep saying uh, uh, percents and I should say degrees. Those are all degrees, because these angles are 144 degrees. That's where my degrees came from. Or my 28.8 and so on. To do a circle graph, you also need to make sure you put a title up. So somebody's gonna get some pizza tomorrow. Circle graphs are a challenge, they take a lot of work, but I'm sure you can do it. Here's a fun saying to help you remember the basic needs of the human body. Oh, can Venus flies make pretty webs? This actually helps you remember oxygen, carbohydrates, vitamins, fats, minerals, protein, water. And now we'd like to welcome Tim Crawley from the Rochester Science and Museum Center. What do you have for us hey, tonight? Good to welcome see you back. again, guys. Good Hi, to Tim. See you. <laughs> right. got a big it's jug there. Got. It is, but it's not what I got. It's what is in the bottle. Okay. And that's what we're going to play. What's in the bottle? What's in the bottle? All, All right. right. So what's in the bottle? Looks like water to me. Looks like water. Well, it's not exactly water. A lot of times when we do this, we've got hints that are sitting around, or maybe red herrings, depending on Sprite. how you look at it. Could be that, could be... I don't know, what's that jug there? Vinegar. 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 Ah. Now, one way to test is we could taste it. No, I don't want to do that. Not a good <laughs> idea. But another way to test is by the smell. Yeah, but you don't want to just go ahead and lean right in and snorkel no, no. orkel it all up. No, you just, what you want to do is learn, we teach how to do wafting. Ah, hmm. Take it, and you go, so give it a waft and see if you, that gives you a little bit of scent, you smell it. I don't anything? know, I don't know what it is. All right, well now try this. That smells like vinegar. It smells like vinegar, so is it vinegar? I don't think it's vinegar. It's not vinegar. <laughs> now, we've got the soda over here. Okay. Like you, and everybody goes for the soda first, because who wouldn't? Because you'd <laughs> want to drink the soda, not the vinegar. But you turn around, what's the cool thing about soda? Carbonated. Carbonated, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if we take this and we shake it up a whole yeah. lot, what's it going to do? F fizzle or... It's going to fizz. Mm -hmm. It's going to... So let's do that as our test. All right. All right. Put, put this on here? Sure. Better safe than sorry. Yeah. And I'll shake it over here a little bit. We'll move this over to the side. All right. A little fizz there. A little fizz. We'll give it another couple of shakes. Hey, mm -hmm. that's not Sprite. <laughs> now, what's it doing? It's changing colors. Yeah, Change color. Blue. Change to blue. Now, we'll take a look. And you think about it. What could I have done to make it turn blue? I don't know, magic, I don't know. <laughs> I could have been sneaky. I could have put a little bit of blue food coloring or dye up on the, into oh, the, the top. Oh, you got on the top when you shake it. got on the top and you shake it, because I could be sneaky like that yeah. and do that, but actually, it's not. Okay. This is gonna talk about indicators. Okay. Uh -huh. And what's an indicator? It's if you're, you're sitting at home right now or here, indicate to me where the door is without saying anything. That can point. Yeah. You can point. And that's what indicators do. Okay. They point at something. Right. So this actually has an indicator inside of it. Okay. And it's going to point to something. If we wait just a little bit, it's going to start to show us exactly what's going on. Right. And that is because inside here isn't just water. Okay. It's water with sodium hydroxide, which is a base. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's got a little bit of dextrose. Is that lightening up? Looks, kinda looks like it. Yeah. It's starting to lighten up. And what yeah. it should do is maybe I shook it a little bit much, but as you wait for a couple of seconds, it'll start to turn lighter and lighter. Okay, cool. And it'll go back to clear in just another minute or so. Okay. So mm -hmm. there's an indicator in there that's right. indicating something, but what is in the bottle? We've got liquid and... Air. 
<laughs> air. <laughs> exactly. So you see it's almost gone back to yep. clear. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So now what did we have to do to get it to turn blue? Shake it. Shake it. So when we shook the bottle, what did we mix? Oxygen and air. Mm -hmm. uh, the and air with the liquid. With the mm -hmm. liquid. And that's exactly what does it. I bet you Mr. Z would be able to tell us exactly why. Well, actually, you have dextrose in there, right? Exactly. Which is, a, 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 like glucose, it's a reducing sugar. And the indicator, methylene blue? And methylene and blue, blue, exactly. Cool. And so that speeds up the reaction. Actually, the 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 uh, glucose or the you dextrose are, are, is a dogs. reducing sugar. <laughs> but that's what's happening. And then cool. when you mix the oxygen, it oxidizes it, you know, the, acts as the oxidizing agent and takes it back to its colored form. Okay, cool. There you go. Goes back to the blue. And if we leave it long enough, that sugar will reduce up, reduce it back to the colors, colorless form and very cool. All right. Exactly, and that's the blue bottle experiment. Blue mm -hmm. bottle you experiment. can always test it by putting it into a smaller vessel, fill it all the way up so there's no air in it at all, and shake it. But if we leave it sealed up, Mr. Z, what do you think will happen to it? You know, eventually, the, the, uh, either the action of the sugar probably first would be used up. I don't know how, how much uh, you've gotten there, but uh, yeah, it just isn't going to work anymore. It's okay. funny. It's all done. So but you made these our, up fresh for us, I know. That's our, our <laughs> like we did. So it's yeah. blue bottle, and it's our indicator. Cool. And there we are. Well, very, very good, Tim. Thank you. I'd like to thank Sorry. you for... Uh, so we'd like to thank Tim for being here tonight. Now, to learn more about the Rochester Museum and Science Center, head to our website, homeworkhotline.org. But stay right there, and we'll be right back in just a second. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion with the same direction and speed unless interfered with. All right, mystery Sam. bottle stuff. Cool. Yeah, you did. Uh, you did a circle graph. I'm okay. going to do a little lesson with the line graph. Okay. Cool. Regents Week's coming up. Yes, it it's is. For some of the kids that will be taking the living environment exam, these are the. Uh, this is in some uh, line graphs off the okay. living environment exam. That's going to be next week. Yeah, it is. And so, you know, that exam is actually given three times a year. The example I'm going to use is actually from 2016. Now, last year it happened to be a bar graph, and that's where you got to be careful. Almost always, it's only happened a couple of times that they've asked for a bar graph. Almost always, it's a it's a, a line graph on that exam. So let's look at it. I know nobody can read this, but this actually actually was over two pages what this question was. So let's take it apart and look at it a little bit at a time. So June 2016, this is the beginning of the of this B section, and it's saying to uh, for most animals, the sex of the offspring is determined by a pair of sex chromosomes. But in some species of reptiles, such as the painted turtle, there's no sex chromosomes, and it's been discovered that the sex of the offspring is determined by the temperature of the nest in which the egg develops. So the first thing we want to do is look at this data table, and if we look at this, notice we have temperature here in Celsius degrees, and it goes from 19 to 25. And then the sex of the offspring in percentages, just like Sam worked with percentages a minute ago, and for males we see it goes from zero to five to 20 to 25, and then back to zero for the last three. For females, it starts out at 100%, and then goes to 95, 80, 75, and 100 for the last three. And it should make sense, if we add these two together going across, it should be 100. Whatever's not a male is gonna be a female. So we see that definitely just looking at our table here before we even look at the graph, we can see that there is an effect that temperature has on determining the, the sex of the offspring. So now let's look at what the, where, the, where students need to get those points in this. First thing it asks is for number 40, question 44 of this, it was 44 to 46, it says mark an appropriate scale without any breaks in the data on each axis. And this is one of the things where in science, what you're gonna do is a little bit different than you'd have to do in math. And we always point this out to the kids. Now this is off the teacher's scoring guide. And it says to allow one credit for an appropriate scale without any breaks in the data, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes, I'm gonna point out that one, on both axes. So get the, get the point, you've gotta get an appropriate scale on both axes. So, what do we need to do? Well, let's first look at the, the range for our x-axis. We know that the independent variable, in this case the temperature, the thing that causes the change is always gonna be our x-axis, and if we look at our highest value, it's 25, our lowest value is 19, so the range on our x-axis has to be six units. In this, in this case, degrees Celsius. Let's look at our y-axis, because remember now we gotta do both correctly to get that credit. 
Let's look at males. Well, the range for males is from 0 to 25, and if we look at from females, the range is from 75 to 100. But here's where it's kind of tricky, because now we're going to have to have two lines on the same axis, so we have to look at this total range, and so we need to do from 0 to 100, because it's 0% for the males for some of them, 100% for the females. By subtracting those, we, get, we have to have 100 units on our y-axis. So let's look at the next point. Here's the graph that they gave you, and it's kind of nice because it's already labeled for you, already has a title, some of the things we put on there, even has the key on here for you. But if we look at our x-axis, the range was, um, excuse me, the number of lines is 11, if I cut across, and on the y-axis, it's also 11, so it's a square, all right? But our range was 6. Now, one way to look, there's several ways to figure out how you're going to fit this on, but if I went by 1s, it would definitely fit. I'd need 6 lines, I have 11. If I went by 2s, I'd need 12 lines. It's not going to fit. So my x-axis, I'm going to go by 1s. Now, my y-axis. Okay, the, the, uh, there's 11 lines, the range, is, um, the range I need to have is 100. Now, remember now, if I started here with zero, that would get me up to 100. If I go by 10s, ah, it would work. All right, I could go by 10s. So let's look at the next. Here's where, you, where you're now going to get the next set of points. If now that you've found an appropriate scale and you've marked it on, you've got to plot your data. So now it says plot the data for the males connecting your points and surrounding each with a circle. You need to do all those to get your point. Same thing with the females, we have to uh, plot our points and surround them with a triangle. And that's very important, because notice you get one credit for correctly plotting those points and for surrounding each point with a circle. If you don't surround them with a circle, you're gonna lose out, even if you got your points in the right spot. All right, so let's look at what we have here. Here's an example of a three credit graph. And notice it's a little bit different than you see in math because in math you always have to have 0, 0 here at the, at the uh, origin. But it's not that case, and it ca can't be that case sometimes in science. So here's our, our data, all properly plotted. Notice that most of the points will fall at the intersection of two lines, but there's always going to be a couple that don't. In this case, the uh, 95 here, and down here um, there's one at 5%. Um, at five, uh, 5%. Five but most of the times it'll fall in that range. What I wanted to point out next, though, is where kids typically lose a lot of points. And this is a note for the teachers, all right? We can only allow credit if you use circles and triangles, like they told you. If you use a different symbol or forget those po to put those on, even though your points are correct, unfortunately, you lose all the points. We can't assume that the origin is 0, 0, unless you've marked it that way, all right? But you cannot get points if you continue your line down. And in math, often you're told to continue to the origin, right? And if you do that, it would make this automatically wrong. So let me show an example of one that looks pretty good, but would receive no credit. First, there's a couple different mistakes this student made. If we look at the females, okay, he's got a line, he connected them all, but he put that little break in there, continued it down to his origin, he's gone beyond his points, unfortunately no points. Here, these points are all cr uh, correctly um, plotted for the males, but notice this line doesn't go through the point, it just goes to the circle and this student will lose that point because he didn't connect all those. So be very careful that you follow the directions carefully, practice those graphs, because those are easy points you shouldn't miss out on. One way to remember the colors in the light spectrum is the name Roy G. Bim. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. All right, Sam, we have a winner in our science challenge. Who do oh, we have out there? Hello, Matthew. Yeah, it's me. Hi, Here Matthew. I am. <laughs> Matthew, what's the reason that this wouldn't work? So with the, with the flashlight, it was an incandescent bulb, which requires a specific polarity. However, with the LED light bulb that you used from the first test where you cross the wires, that one's LED. It doesn't require a specific polarity. Actually, just the opposite of the way you said it. You had the right idea. The incandescent bulb, it doesn't matter which way the polarity is, right? But with an LED, it does. It can only be go one way. And do you, do you know what LED stands for, Matthew? 
light emitting diode. The light emitting diode. And diodes are like one way streets. They only allow that electrical energy to go in one direction. And so when I reversed the battery in this, it didn't work, but we've reversed it back and it works fine now. So All with right. an incandescent light, you're right, it doesn't matter. But with an LED, it's got to be the right direction or it's not going to work. So you did a great job, Matthew. Great. All right, thank you. All right, great, congratulations. Great job, Matthew. How did you know that, though? That was, that was a well, great job. Well, I actually um, did a little bit of research. All right, cool. well, that's good. Cool. Very good. All right. All right, congratulations. But don't forget, every correct response goes in our Homework Hotline Hall of Fame. And if you're earning enough points, you can win that tablet at the end of the season. That's all that we have time for tonight. But get your ice skates ready, because next week on Homework Hotline, we'll be taking a look at the Winter Olympics. Good night. Bye, guys. Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers, working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSIT, working for communities across New York State.